Perfect. Uh, welcome, everyone, at the weekly governance sessions. Uh, today, uh, we are welcoming Dennis from MakerDAO. Uh, Dennis is the product management for their governance tooling, and he will he probably introduce better the session, but he will walk us through what Maker is actually dealing with now and what are the pros and cons on on check governance and what he sees as the as the future for governance tooling and governance model. So. Thanks everyone uh, for being here and thank you, Dennis, for coming. And uh, it's all yours now. Thanks, Jan, for the intro. I appreciate it. And yeah, good to be here. I was I was excited to hear about this. And as I said before, I'm trying to connect with other people in the space that are working and are thinking about governance because uh, yeah, it tends to be very, very reassuring. And sometimes you're trying to solve a problem that's already uh, been solved somewhere else. So um, yeah. I have a bit of a weird session in mind today, but those are actually the, the most fun, I believe. So I'm not going to do some kind of keynote presentation. We're not at a conference. I didn't pay for my speaker slot, so I'm not going to show you something. I kind of feel like we're all um, passionate about this, this particular topic, uh, down governance and everything that's related to it. So I kind of feel like I'm just gonna, at one point, give some uh, some context, some some perspective from what I've been seeing at MakerDAO when it comes to, to governance, the state of MakerDAO governance. And then from there on, I think we can just have a, some kind of free-flowing free discussion um, based on where the interest is in, in this group. So um, before I'll start a quick introduction about myself, just to give some context, I'm really curious about everyone in the call. So if you can just type a quick message, what, what your role, what you're doing. Um, yeah, because that will also help me make this uh, as relevant as possible. Am I dealing with, let's say, Web3 nerds, or are you are you all really like working at, at some kind of project in, an, in a governance-related role? Yeah, we'll be really curious to know. Feel free to just drop it in the chat. Yeah, uh, in the chat or, or here? I mean, here is more fun, but if you're shy, then chat is also of fine. Of course. Uh, so, so my name is Doug. I work with Metis. Um, Primarily the Community Ecosystem Governance Program, and that is our um, kind of uh, business development and, um, adjacent role that, that our community votes on different projects they want us to co-market with, um, usually newer projects that you know might not have the reputation or um, time in the industry that, that other more established ones do. But in the future, that's actually going to evolve as, as, you know, we're an optimistic rollout-based um, layer two that that's going to evolve as we completely go decentralized and our all of our business units are, are kind of decentralizing and so we're designing out the entire governance structure what that's going to look like what the proposal process is the voting you know how much control um or total decentralization all these independent um we're calling them nodes you know business units are going to have so i'm um, just trying to meet other thought leaders and and uh also uh, hear from other experiences uh you know like you said it's always easier if we, um pick a low-hanging fruit if we've all uh, might have done something before and can help each other out nice that's that's great and i yeah i i can tell that um we have uh, people in the audience from projects that are all somewhere on on, on this on this scale of super centralized and super decentralized and What's, what's usually interesting is that all of these projects are trying to move into the same direction, which is more decentralized. And I think in that sense, it's really interesting to try and learn from, from each other and learn from uh, the projects that are fit a, a bit further down that scale and are dealing with their own problems. So uh, that's actually what we're going to talk about today, because yeah, as you all know, Maker is a pretty old protocol. I think it's the, pretty much the oldest DeFi protocol out there. And um, yeah, that's also what makes it interesting in, in this regard. I'll share my screen um, and I'm just gonna walk you through some, some stuff that I had in mind. Um, before that, I'll quickly introduce myself. So my name is Dennis and I am, um, yeah, well, as, as Jan said before, I am with MakerDAO. I am what they call a core unit facilitator, um, which basically means I'm leading one of the core units at MakerDAO. Core units are like these, smaller independent teams um, within MakerDAO that fulfill this uh, particular mandate. 
And in order to become a core unit and, and be funded by the protocol, you have to go through this governance process of basically writing a, a proposal for what your core unit is about um, and what your mandate is and, and the budget and things like that. Um, I am a product manager by background. I've been working in the blockchain space since early 2018, but I've been in DeFi since 2020. That's when the FOMO got so bad that I just had to make a switch into the space, and I'm very happy that I did. And um, yeah, so that's basically my, my role. The development and UX core unit, that's basically the name of my team. Um, yeah, development and UX core unit, but we all call ourselves the Docs team. And what we are basically doing is we are uh, a, a product team. So we have uh, designers and developers in our team. We are with six in total. And we basically um, are currently fully focused on MakerDAO's governance tooling and infrastructure. So that means, for example, the, uh, the governance portal, which is the, the, the main front end that people use to interact with Maker Governance. But there's also all these uh, infrastructure uh, running in, in, in the background that we're also building and maintaining and improving. Um, so that's that's a little bit about me. And yeah, this is the Maker Protocol. <laughs> this is a pretty old system diagram. So I think by now it's it's already um, it's already redundant in the sense that um, there's um, a, a bunch of components missing. There's probably some components here that have been uh, upgraded or uh, uh, replaced altogether. And uh, yeah, the question is, how do you govern a system like this, especially in a decentralized context? Um, and it's 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 an interesting story because um, Maker was founded like a long time ago. I think it was founded in 2017, actually, but maybe even before that. And back then, it was a it it was a a company, right? So there was this guy Rune Rune Christensen from uh, from Denmark, um, and he came up with this idea together with his uh, with his co-founder. And um, yes, yeah, started building it, started building a company around it as well. Uh, the Maker Foundation, it was called. It's funny, when I was in, uh, in DEF CON and in, in Osaka at, uh, at, De at uh, DEF CON in 2019, I was there on my own. I was feeling a bit of a loner. I didn't know that many people in the space. I actually made this picture um, of, the, of the Maker team back then. There were a lot of people out there. These people were all employed by the, by the foundation. Um, and yeah, I never thought I would be part of that group in, in that sense, because I can still recognize a lot of faces that are currently active in the DAO. A lot of them already moved uh, uh, moved on. But um, so what happened is at one point, um, the Maker Foundation dissolved itself and basically transferred all of its MKR and all of its funds to the DAO that they have been, been slowly building out um, because yeah, that was the, the mission altogether, right? They wanted to uh, decentralize. Maker DAO should become a DAO, and they were finally ready, uh, as as they believed, right? Um, and what what happened um, is there's this um, very very elegant and very elaborate governance uh, system that has been created by the Maker Foundation, uh, what we call MIPS, um, and it's basically let's say the, the the rules that um yeah that that would that would be the the foundation of decentralized governance right because it's a very risky move if you uh if you transfer your funds but also control of the protocol right the the, the control of all of these contracts if you transfer it to a smart contract if you transfer it to uh, to uh, decentralized governance because suddenly you need to take into account the other MKR holders out there, and you need to provide the, the means for them to to coordinate and to collaborate and to organize, because they will have to um, lead the ship together. It's no longer the, the experts in the workforce that have full mandate and full control. And there's also no CEO that has uh, absolute power. You're, you're dealing with some kind of shareholders right now, some of which you're not even, uh, you, you don't even know who they are. You don't know how to reach them. So um, that's where the MIPS structure came in. Um, it's very elaborate. There's a lot of MIPS out there. I'm not even sure how many, but there's a lot. Okay, there's 79 at this at this stage. A lot of them have uh, sub MIPS as well. So, for example, if I go to the MIP40, um, 
or the core unit framework, for example, there are some sub-MIPS uh, there as well. And all this was made available in a front end as well. Uh, let me just link this in the in the call chat because I'm pretty sure that most of you haven't haven't seen this yet. So um, yeah, and the team also built a governance portal. It it didn't look like the way that it looks now. It was very uh, it it was a bit more um, yeah more, more basic and more uh, yeah more uh, minimal in that sense. But it uh, yeah it, in a way Maker was ready to become a DAO and. It actually turned out pretty well because um, there were a lot of um, teams that mobilized to become a core unit. So there has been, uh, uh, the, the, yeah, I, I would say a lot of important people from the Maker Foundation. They organized themselves into core units and they wrote, um, um, yeah, they wrote proposals like these, and they got voted in and they they got funded and they started doing the work to keep the Maker protocol uh, running. And this all worked worked fine, right? So operationally, everything worked really well, I would say. I think where we are today at MakerDAO is we are first and foremost in a very different uh, context, right? We are in a um, um, we are in a very, very bearish environment, and we've seen revenue um, of the that the protocol generates uh, drop. And what we've what we've also come to realize is that we are now at a point that the um, that the maker maker DAO right the organization as a DAO has be, has grown so large. There are like I think sixteen or seventeen core units right now. I think there is about one hundred sixty people that are being uh, let's say employed by the DAO that are being paid out by the protocol. And what we've noticed is that this 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 huge framework right the MIPS framework and the core units framework it's starting to lose its shine because things are just becoming too complex. There are too many people in the organization. There's too much complexity going on. And um, the, the, the main, yeah, the most important participants in, in maker governance, being the MKR token holders and the, and the delegates, they're basically slowly losing their capability to keep track of everything and to coordinate. And what we've been seeing is um, this. <laughs> So this is a chart um, that visualizes the, let's say, the, the profit that the Maker Protocol generates, and this is the the the, the purple line are the die expenses that the protocol is is uh, is supporting. So that's basically the cost of of the workforce. And ever since uh, this summer, especially because things have been turning really bearish, um, we are at a point where the where Maker is not not profitable. I mean. There's still liquidation income as well, so we sh that, but that's not something you'd like to rely on because that's only um, that's only there in case of high volatility. It's more important to look at the fee income, which is actually the 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 the, the, the revenue that Maker generates from vaults from CDPs, and this is the situation that that we're in currently. So there is this strong urgency to uh, to to change direction, right? We need to figure out how we're going to deal with this, um, yeah, with this high um, expense, right? This, this high burn rate. Um, and that's actually where we ended up a few months ago. Um, the main challenge was that apparently maker governance, so the, the, the system that, we, that we've all together built, right? With the MIPS and with all of these, these tools, all of these front ends, it's apparently very difficult to to coordinate on um, more abstract and more long-term topics like what is Maker, right? What's the long-term vision for Maker? Because Maker as a protocol, it's pretty easy to 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 describe. But what is the Maker DAO about? What's this organization about? Where do they want to take this this project, right? That's a that's a very difficult topic. But then also, how are we going to uh, how are we going to get there, right? So, what's going to be our strategy, and what's going to be our strategy in light of uh, RWA, right? So, real world assets, which is something that the DAO rallied behind a, a, a while ago, but uh, now uh, grown very contentious again, uh, also because of the recent regulatory context that we operate in. It's uh, obviously a very different environment compared to like one or two years ago the threat has always been there but especially since the tornado cash uh, uh, incident things have just grown more urgent and also 
things have become more clear in the sense that the 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 attack factors or the the yeah let's say the 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 main risks are starting to to reveal themselves so that's where we are currently we have a we have a DAO of about 160 people in the workforce and then also hundreds of mkr token holders and i think by now 20 delegates um, and some whales like the original founder of maker but also some funds that are just unable to find consensus because it's just incredibly difficult right there is no mip for setting of a vision for maker down there is no uh, there is no mip for defining a growth strategy or something like that so what we've been seeing is we've been seeing a lot of initiatives um, being initiated by people from the workforce um, there's for example um, the let's see this is one example there's a bunch of um, people from the workforce that i really respect and that i think are really really capable they proposed this this concept of a, a task force where they basically try to get more mandate and, and more let's say freedom to to execute um in order to try and shake us out of this let's say governance gridlock that we are uh, that we are currently in and then there's also people like uh, like hasu for example one of our delegates um who, st who started working on this uh, huge long-term proposal for maker as a protocol but also maker as a governance system and then of course we have the end game plan which is the um um, the, the huge proposal that has been written by Rune, the original founder of Maker, who returned after being um, uh, yeah after being inactive for a long time. He returned like uh, probably almost a year ago uh, already. But then again, it's still incredibly difficult to 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 find consensus, right? So that's that's where we currently are at Maker. So I would say um, the maker as a as a as a DAO and also the governance um system that we currently operate in it's it succeeded in 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 getting us where we are now it succeeded in keeping the lights on it, su it succeeded in keeping it secure right because uh maker still hasn't had any like huge uh hacks or compromise or anything like that and i think that's a huge accomplishment but we also have to um admit that we're in some kind of governance gridlock right now and we really need to move out of this before we can uh before before we can move on before we can start executing again because also the workforce is very um is operating in a lot of uncertainty right we don't really know where maker is going in the long term so it's really hard to build like a long-term roadmap it's also hard to build a team because you're not really sure whether um the DAO actually wants your team to to expand right maybe the, the DAO wants to actually uh cut costs altogether so that's that's where we are today and what i've been seeing in the past couple of weeks is um a lot of elaborating so for example runes endgame proposal is being being slowly elaborated and being more detailed and there's a lot of people that are starting to participate in, in this thinking and are starting to um, try and understand what it would what it would look like the nice thing is that also some some aspects of the uh, proposal by by Hasu is, is also being uh, uh, yeah it seems like there's some kind of soft consensus that for example we need this uh, we need this notion of a constitution at Maker as as a way to uh, to limit the the design space for for governance and also guide governance participants. Um, but we are not there yet. It's still an ongoing process. Um, I think Maker is also still recovering from the uh, huge, um, yeah, let's say the Tornado Cash event and all of the controversy that it sparked internally. So I would say right now that the dust is slowly starting to settle. Um, the, the longer term and more complex proposals that are on the table are slowly being more elaborated. And I feel like the next step is going to be some kind of governance polls, like a set of governance polls that are trying to um find um some kind of consensus within maker so that we at least can start focusing and and, and zooming in on, on particular aspects of these proposals and also start thinking about execution um so yeah that's a bit of context um i'll just pause my screen share for a bit because that's i think good context for all of you to have about maker uh in the sense that this is how it how it got to where it is today and this is what we're dealing with today and i feel like 
we can talk about a bunch of things, right? So first off, I'm um, I'm with a team that builds our governance tooling. So I could show you more about uh, about that. I could show you how the, the governance portal works and all of its functionalities. But I can also talk about what we have in mind for that um, for that for that tool for the makers governance tooling. We can also have a bit of a discussion around, um, yeah, let's say this governance gridlock that I mentioned before, right? So what does it look like, and what are the the avenues to try and uh, and, and break that that uh, that that situation that we're in? Maybe you want to learn more about um, how it is to be working and and leading a team in this decentralized context where you really have to, I don't know, you have to convince MPR token holders of. The, the value of your team and also your budget and things like that and how it works in terms of uh, reporting accountability roadmaps that's also something i'd be happy to talk about so this is um, basically where we can uh, together decide where to go and i'm going to start with uh, sergio go ahead thank you denise first for uh, the amazing summary that you just did uh, that was amazing i have one question and I have other thing that's not a question, more a request. I want to know more. Uh, what do you need to create this custom tooling for the governance of, of an organization? Like what kind of team, what kind of technologies do you uh, um, you have to use and all of that? But first, the question, how do you, do you optimize for running experiments and tests when the organization is so big? Like the way I work is I like to break things. And that works well with, you know, small organizations, low risk things. But when you have thousands of people, you know, um, being stakeholders on a single organization, that's not possible. So how do you do it in Maker? And then, yes, I would love to know how to create custom tooling for your governance. Cool. Yeah, that's a really good question. So thanks. I think that's also, uh, yeah, we, we, we can talk about a lot. So I'm just going to share my screen once again, and then we can just have a bit of a conversation around that. So first and foremost, I think the um, so some important context about Maker is that when it was when it was built, when it was designed, there was no uh, DAO governance tooling in industry yet, right? right? I mean, Right now, if you, if, you, if you want to spin up a DAO around some kind of NFT project or something like that, there's a whole range of, of white label tools that you, can, that you can choose from, and it's very easy to set up. And yeah, that, that, that simply wasn't there, right? So Maker, Maker's governance system, both its on-chain governance, but also its off-chain governance, it's, it's all bespoke, it's all custom built. And I actually feel like that's a feature and, and not a bug, I feel like, if you're a, an important protocol that really aims to become a low level piece of infrastructure in the internet economy, then you don't want to rely on some third party uh, to run your governance infrastructure, right? You want to do it yourself. Um, so I, I'm very convinced that that's, a, that that's a good thing. And it also, it also allows extreme flexibility and, and, and continued bespoke development, right? So, for example, right now, my team is working together with uh, the Gov Alpha core unit, which is another team at Maker. They are basically the governance facilitators, and they basically um, make sure that the, the, the governance processes are, um, are, are respected and are, and are uh, used correctly. And they have been doing research on, um, let's say, governance primitives for DAO-wide prioritization. And they came up with this uh, really cool concept. They they wrote a specification, and now we're like uh, we're we're designing what that's going to look like in the front end. Um, we can actually build that before the end of the year, and that's something I think that's 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 really cool. So that's some context about Maker's governance tooling. Um, when it comes to running uh, experiments, that's a really good question. That's that's a, a, a big thing that I'm I'm dealing with in my team as well because. Um, obviously, when you have a DAO running and you have a DAO that secures billions of, of user funds and it's, it's, it's a running train, it's very difficult to change uh, the, the, the governance system. It is possible and not that difficult to change governance processes, right? And also like the, the top layer, so the front ends and stuff like that, that is definitely something that you can, th th there's a lot of malleability there. But the on-chain governance infrastructure is very difficult to change. Um, 
um, and also hard to, to, to experiment. So I will be honest by saying that um, those, um, those changes are less incremental, I would say. It's, it's harder to incrementally change the on-chain governance system. But what you what what you can do, of course, is you can try and and um, account for it on the on the layers on top. So, for example, my team we are um, we are building things like web apps and underlying infrastructure that basically interfaces with the on-chain components, and that's actually where you still have a lot of leverage, right, for the for the user experience. So, basically, if you want to solve a problem, if you want to make an improvement, before you start tweaking the on-chain uh components which requires smart contract engineering which requires audits it uh, removes the, the lindy effect of the of the contracts that you already have right uh, just to double click on that if you have a smart contract that has been in use for two years and it's been securing billions of funds and it hasn't been hacked then there's a high probability that it's not going to be hacked anytime soon whereas if you make changes to that contract or if you replace it then you remove this um this this superpower altogether right you're basically um susceptible to all of these hidden risks and things that you you you, you don't see so what i'm trying to say is that when you want to run experiments when you want to improve the um, let's say the ux of of governance it's probably better to focus on front ends right so on 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 the user experience but also on on process and on policy so try and fix it on layers on, on, on top of the smart contracts themselves um, and that's exactly what we've been trying to do um, one example one recent example is um, back when i wasn't working for maker um, this whole thing got uh, or th th this whole governance on-chain governance system was 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 built and it also at one point included uh, delegates right so you had this uh, smart contract, which we, which we call the vote delegate factory. And you could interact with that contract. And then you would create what we call a uh, vote delegate contract. And that's basically a, a, a delegate contract where people can delegate their MKR to. And what they, um, what they decided back then, so the, the team that has been working on this, they decided to add this notion of ex expiration. So if you create a, a delegate contract, then it expires after one year. And what that means is that if it expires, you can no longer use that contract to vote with it, and you can no longer delegate MKR to that to that delegate contract. You can still undelegate your MKR, but yeah, the, the, the interactions are very limited. And that this was um this was a design choice that was deliberate, right? They they tried to build in some kind of protection. Um, for example, if a delegate would lose access to their um, to their delegate contract or it got hacked or something like that that it doesn't end up permanently um, um yeah having that mkr locked in that in that contract so the, the first thing that comes to mind is okay we need to fix those delegate contracts in order to um in order to um yeah mitigate this problem of, of expiration maybe we can add some kind of renewal function but the thing is if if we wanted to if we wanted to go that route then i'd have to talk with the protocol engineering team that's the team that holds all of the smart contracts, like the, 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 the real big brains at the at MakerDAO. They are so busy, like they're they they're just constantly under high pressure. So what we've actually decided to do is we've decided to uh, mitigate this this issue in the front end, where we basically have um, adapted the front end in a way that it would also uh, let's see, yeah, that it would still display these old expired delegate contracts but it had this uh, migration flow where delegates or owners of a delegate contract that already that almost expired they could go through this flow to create a new delegate contract from scratch and then establish some kind of link between their old and new contract so that ux wise it's not that bad right if you uh, so this delegate for example has a renewed contract that's that's valid for for like a year and most of their delegators already migrated as well because there was this banner that they could click and then they, they just had to do a few clicks and then their MKR was 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 delegated. So that's one important thing to, to note. Um, apart from that, how do you how do you run experiments? How do you um, how do you gain feedback on on your work before you 
to put it to production. We don't do A-B testing of some sort because the traffic is simply too too low. That's not, not feasible. I think that's only feasible for like, uh, I don't know, we're still, this is still a very niche product, right? This is the governance tool of a DeFi protocol. So in that sense, that's not really an option. What we try to do is we do a lot of um, ideation sessions within our team, right? So within our team of six, but we also um, we talk a lot with some power users. So we have some delegates, but also some other users, some even pseudonymous users that are generally very um, engaged and that are very happy to uh, share their thoughts and to be like our, our guinea pig. So we try to 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 gain feedback in that sense. Um, but also, I will have to be honest by saying that um, this is not a, a product like Instagram, right, where you have to where you have like a ton of engineers trying to optimize until the very last bit, right? To 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 get those algorithm right, get those uh, uh, get those revenues up. We are a very small team. Um, we have about four FTE worth of the developer capacity. We have a lot of uh, things that we would still like to do. Like our backlog is is huge, and there are so many ideas that I would like to explore with my team, but we simply don't have the capacity. So we always try to just be in tune with Maker uh, and, and the DAO and what its needs and its wants are, right? And we try to build the things that are relevant and we try to do it in an, in an efficient way as well, right? So we don't try to perfect it. We just try to, uh, to, to build what's, what's needed. But um, when it comes to running experiments on things like, um, I don't know, new poll types, um, that's something that would be possible with things like, I don't know, like an, a new setup for on-chain governance. That's definitely a, a, hard, a difficult question. I think the only thing you can do is you can uh, try and learn from other projects, right? So if, uh, a while ago, I remember that Element Finance, they launched their governance and that was really, really fascinating to me, really inspirational. And uh, yeah, like a few days ago, Kohei, who was also in the call, he shared uh, something with me as well. It's just good to 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 learn from from other projects and try to take some 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 learnings from those experiments and try to uh, to implement them as well and then there's this one other thing i wanted to to share that's something that i learned very recently at an, at a remote event and that's this this mental model of the waterline and that basically um, is a mental model that you can use to distinguish very important decisions from less important decisions so if a decision is above the, the waterline, it means that it's reversible, right? So for example, if I uh, if I change anything in this UI, for example, I don't know, something related to the filters here, and it ends up not being right, it ends up not being used, or you get a lot of negative feedback, then you can always go back and, and change it or improve it. But there's also um, decisions below the waterline. And those are decisions that are usually irreversible, right? So if you, if you make changes to, I don't know, uh, if you add some kind of incentive program or if you make changes to certain on-chain um, um, components, then it might be something that will never be uh, revertible, right? Because, yeah, that uh, that uh, genie is out of the bottle. Or maybe some it, it, it uh, creates some damage that is irreversible. So that's another thing to, um, to take into account. Okay, that was a long... Um, a long answer. I'm just going to check with Sergio if that some somewhat answers your question. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. I just I just want to reach that level of you know designing my own tooling for specific projects. I think that's just I don't know. It's much better than just using off the shelf tools. Yeah, I, I I will say that it's uh, that that only that only applies to projects that are let's say, at a, at a further stage, right? And that are, for example, a DeFi protocol that already holds a lot of funds and that has also the execution power and, and the money to, 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 exactly. to, 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 It was like keep saying like two two. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna remix that. Yeah, it was it was good. Yeah, it was a nice beat. Yeah, we can set it up and. <laughs>
I think it really emphasized the point. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> this was amazing, though, just from, from a hand. Oh. so knowledgeable. Oh, there you are. Let's try again. Is it better now? Yes, better. Yeah, it was yeah, just some loop. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. On your voice. I've had that issue before. It's it's something related to my to my webcam. Anyways, um, I also lost all of the questions in my chat, so I'm gonna need a new question. <laughs> so I can I can maybe uh, I can read some of the question, but because I'm selfish, I will use my first. Uh, uh, so actually, regarding that, like you're building your own tooling, and there are many other tools on the market. Uh, are you thinking? to either cooperate maybe on some parts, like, you know, do some part of the governance actually with some external tools, which is already developed or proving to be, be very innovative and you might want to try it out. So you use their technology. And also on the other uh, side, uh, and that's what also as a delegate, I'm kind of trying to find if that's the right way for uh, coordinate, maybe also like use your tool and maybe for external parties. So it can be almost like revenue generating eventually. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So that's something that's always been a topic within our team because we, we are aware of the fact that there's a lot of really good tooling out there, right? So we have things like Tally, Snapshot. I mean, it, it looks great, it works great. I think where we are in that sense is that we, we really try and, and, and collaborate with teams that want to integrate maker governance into their front end. So at this very moment, we're working with some uh, developer from Boardroom, that's also a DAO governance tool, to make sure that uh, maker governance is, 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 is well integrated into that UI. I mean, that's something that where we always uh, try to help. The same goes for uh, crypto custodians. So for example, there's this um, uh, company called uh, Anchorage, and they basically hold crypto for institutional investors and they have their own interface so that those institutional investors can interact with maker governance and delegate their MKR. That's also something that we that we uh, basically provided uh, execution power. When it comes to using other governance tools for, for maker, we've been, um, yeah, we've recently um, uh, considered that because we wanted to introduce gasless voting for polls because right now governance polls are all still on chain and that sucks because it's just expensive right now it's not that expensive but it used to be like eight bucks for for a poll vote which is really bad because it adds a lot of friction and negative um, uh, incentives to governance participation so initially we wanted to see if we could somehow integrate with with snapshot right because they have a really elegant uh, gasless voting uh, system uh, based on off-chain signatures, and they're also working on something uh, uh, using zero knowledge proofs. That is going to be really awesome. But we ended up um, we ended up with the conclusion that it's simply not a good um, decision because we'd had to make a lot of compromises in terms of functionality, but also interface. And then we also figured we can probably build something ourselves, um, and we should probably build it on top of the current infrastructure because of all these integrations, right? I think maker governance is now at a point where you cannot recklessly make changes because there's a lot of uh, companies that have integrated with it. There is also um, these institutional uh, uh, participants that you basically lose if you, if you break the, the governance infrastructure because they can no longer participate. So what we've done instead is we've, we've uh, learned from these, these other uh, tools like Snapshot, but also uh, some, some other examples out there. And we built our own gasless voting system that we're going to launch next month. That's something I'm really excited about. And that's basically um, a system that uses Arbitrum to, to submit vote events, but we actually subsidize these transactions for a user. So there's like a relayer that posts uh, transactions uh, on, on Arbitrum that holds a user's vote. So the vote is still registered on chain. People can still verify that their vote has been recorded, but they don't have to uh, pay for that cast themselves. They don't need to do network switching and stuff. And what's nice about this is that it's, it doesn't break the existing system. So people could actually decide to use 
the, the, the old poll voting system or switch to the gasless voting system if they want to, right? If you have like a, a, a custodian that has built this integration, they're probably still going to use the old system because it's not worth the effort. If you have like thousands of MKR, you don't want to, you don't bother about $8 for a vote. Um, so yeah, that's one, one example. So I would say when it comes to um, make your own feature versus buy your feature, I feel like it's, um, it's still difficult because yeah, as I said, makers, governance system, and also the processes are so, yeah, let's say bespoke and complex that it's, it, there's rarely a situation where you can use an external tool. But yeah, if it's possible, then it should definitely be uh, be considered. Cool. Actually, uh, on last uh, delegates or office hours, there was brought up a proposal to introduce JokeDAO into MakerDAO. I don't know if you're aware of it. So. Now you are aware of it. Uh, we actually I, had. I have, uh, seen that. I have seen that. Yeah. So I we had uh, David from Joke Dow here, like I think two weeks ago. We will have him next week as well. So we will be a little bit talking about that. So you can, uh, you are free to join us. I know that my, Monday doesn't work for you, but you can see the recording. Uh, we will be kind of discussing how Joke Dow uh, can improve maker Dow, uh, Dow governance as well. So and now questions from the audience. Uh, so I see here uh, from the uh, doc, uh, the on-chain versus off-chain governance, probably what are the advantages on on-chain governance? Is there anything what you would maybe consider off-chain uh, for uh, MakerDAO? Yeah, okay, that's a really good question. I would say um, Maker is, is, is a bit of a unique, projects in the, in the sense that there is Maker, the protocol, and there is Maker, the DAO, right, the organization. So the protocol, as we looked at before, this is the protocol, right? There, is, there are these smart contracts that have some, some parameters, and those parameters, they need to be changed all the time, right? So things like rates and things like debt ceilings, you need to change those parameters in order to make sure that the uh, protocol is still secure that it's still profitable that's constantly being being changed but obviously this whole system is designed to be decentralized and to be resilient so the only way to to change those um to, to change those parameters in in most cases is by going through governance and what that looks like in practice is um what we call an executive spell so um let's just go to one example this is a, an executive spell. Yeah, this is a spell, and this contains the, the code um, that once executed makes the, the changes to the on-chain uh, parameters. But obviously, before you, before you get to that point, you need to align on what the parameter changes are, right? So what happens is there is this uh, governance process that starts on the forum. Um, so usually there's a proposal that's written here, and then there's a uh, there's a poll where you can vote on without any MKR tokens. It's more like a like a softer uh, yeah, consensus tool. And then later on, there are governance polls where you can signal your preference for certain things. So here, let me for example look up uh, let's see risk parameter for example. Yeah, here's a recent proposal from the Open Market Committee. So that's like a bunch of stakeholders that are uh, working to to uh, to decide on changes to to rates. That looks like this, for example. Maker governance votes, and then um, yeah, then there is a winner. But that doesn't mean that the the on-chain parameters have changed, right? This basically means that there is consensus within the organization, and when when that happens, then the workforce, right? So the, the protocol engineers, they can start writing a, an executive spell that contains the changes that were requested here. So basically, you have this governance cycle where there are governance polls to find consensus within the organization. And then every week, those changes get bundled up into an executive spell. And that gets posted as an executive proposal. And then people have to basically stake their MKR on that proposal and once it has um once it has passed 
then you can actually uh, execute the spell. And that's when the on-chain parameters have, have changed. So when it comes to off-chain versus on-chain governance, it depends. Are we talking about managing on-chain parameters or are we talking about uh, yeah, finding consensus within an organization? So if you're like a smaller NFT project, you don't need on-chain governance, obviously. But yeah, if you're a decentralized DeFi protocol, you need on-chain governance, but that also means you will need off-chain governance to to uh, um, yeah to figure out what needs to change in the first place. So those spells are kind of like uh, like a governance roll-up. I'm I'm not sure right. I'm not sure if that's the right mental model. I I would say it's like a, a you're just rolling up different different uh, single issues into one uh, package of of spells. Yeah, yeah. I would say it's the execution stage of uh -huh. a, so, some other governance proposals that have been agreed on so only in an executive spell are parameters changed on the maker protocol if there's a governance pool that actually it it, it doesn't do anything it's just off oh, chain I so it, yeah. i think a better way to frame it is governance pools off chain governance is also enforced off chain right so if there's a poll and something wins then someone needs to go and do that Whereas if an on-chain governance proposal is passed, then things are changed on-chain. So it's enforced by the blockchain. Perfect. Uh, so I think we have one more question. Uh, Marcus, but you can go first. Ah, OK, cool. Uh, let me like, switch my camera on just a second. Let you see. That's OK. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am. Okay. Uh, yeah. First of all, yeah. Awesome talk. Uh, thanks for all. Uh, so I, I wonder, like, how do you manage governance participation, and what are your KPIs to see if you are on track? Really good question. Um, I will be honest by saying that it's definitely a challenge. Um, that's been. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> I mean, um, there are a bunch of improvements that happened like over the over the last year or so. Obviously, adding vote delegation has been a huge success because it ends up um, it basically turns out that people that hold an or hold a governance token are not necessarily interested in in uh, yeah being involved in governance full time because it really is a full time job. You need people that are incentivized and motivated to do that. So we have governance uh, then a recognized delegates that are being paid also that have a salary because they are big delegates and they actually do all the work we have also been looking into incentivization but that's something i have personally been advocating against because i believe that that something like governance mining only incentivizes participation but it doesn't incentivize um, informed voting i actually believe it can be very toxic to a to a, a protocol so what 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 else can you do you can um make it easier to keep track of things right so you can try and and um d d let's say i don't know you can make the the governance cadence more um more in sync right so people know when to expect uh, budget proposals when to expect uh new polls to be uh, uh to be posted you can standardize the way that uh core units do reporting you can standardize the way that um, certain discussions or updates take place, all, all just to make it easier for governance participants to keep track of things. Another thing you can do, of course, is lower the, the friction of voting. So that's something that we are working on right now. Make it as yeah, cheap and easy and also as fun as possible to vote. Um, yeah, I think that's the, the, those are the, let's say, the, the, the least risky things you can do. Of course, you could also um add incentives to to governance participation but i would just once again underline that you should really make sure that you're incentivizing the right type of behavior i actually believe that uh, active participation without being informed so in the form of uh, i don't know just uh, airdrop farming or something that's incredibly i mean if if you're like um in a, in a stage where you're where you're raising funds and you want to just show these vanity metrics of yeah we have thousands of people voting then you should definitely do uh, something like that but if you're actually decentralized so if you actually 
um, if the governance outcome is actually going to have an impact on the protocol, then it, I think it's better to have a, a handful of engaged people, informed voters, as opposed to hundreds of bots and airdrop farmers. Yeah. Th I thank you for that. yeah, I agree with that. Thank you for 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 that answer. It, and if I'm allowed, just one little little uh, question uh, again. Uh, uh, last week we had uh, an awesome talk about like delegate voting and and uh, stuff like that. So, like your your personal view, would you say there's a possibility to make a to build a system this big without having delegate voting in place, so that like me as an uninformed un unknowable voter can actually like vote and have an impact of the of the faith of the of the protocol where there's so much money at stake my my personal take is that it can exist besides one another so for example at maker you can become a delegate but you can also just buy some mkr and start start voting and start writing proposals yourself it's really permissionless in that sense but I will also be honest by saying that if you want to have a real impact at, at maker governance, you have to really spend a lot of time on it, right? Because, yeah, you have to understand it. You have to be informed about everything that's happening. Um, and in order to start writing proposals and starting to, in, in that way, really contribute, you have to have a lot of context. And the, the reality is that um, that's probably only worth it if you have some kind of financial incentive, unless you're really passionate about what you're doing. Um, so yeah, I, I would say both is possible. I think it's important to also guard that principle. People should always be able to jump in and, and, and start contributing and start voting. But I do believe that especially for complex things like, uh, like the DeFi protocol, you do need some kind of um, super engaged set of participants that are, that are actually also have some, some kind of responsibilities um, in place. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank so we have last four minutes. So CryptoDeath, uh, what's your question? And then we need to wrap up. Great. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Pankar. So my question is, uh, I see a scenario that when a small group of people in the DAO community, uh, they maybe form an initiative. Those initiatives are only you know, going to benefit uh, the small group. And they threw out the proposal in the DAO uh, and got voted. Uh, get the proposal passed because you know the uh, the group is uh, have a you know uh, considerable amount of people, um, but then other people actually have no clue, uh, you know, and they are not maybe not relevant. They so you know only those group of people vote and get it passed, and actually the the proposal gonna hurt the DAO. But just in that situation, do you have any suggestion to prevent that happening? Thank you. That's a really good question. And that's, you, you know, what's funny. This is actually an, an, uh, an insight or let's say a conclusion that uh, that Rune, the original founder of Maker, actually drew a, a while ago. And that actually is one of the main reasons for him to return to Maker and become active again, because he, he had this, he had a feeling that there was this, um, he calls it a complexity spiral where you have a bunch of people, very intelligent people in the Maker workforce that are like working hard and they're doing all kinds of cool stuff. But if they start making the calls, right, and if they start being too influential on the delegates, then it ends up this small group that might not be um, yeah, working towards the best outcome for MKR holders or other stakeholders, right, die holders, for example. So I think that's definitely an, a phenomenon that can happen. I think that's actually inevitable unless you do something about it. So. I will say that it's uh, it's important that you have proper checks and balances in place for all uh, yeah for all stakeholder types, but I will also say that that's very difficult to uh, to, to to design. I know that Rune with his endgame proposal made a, made a try there, um, but yeah, I, I will say that that's uh, it's an uh, it's a phenomenon that you can definitely uh, observe, and uh, yeah, you need to account for that through checks and balances. So if you have nothing to do uh, this weekend, uh, check the forum, the end game proposal, I think it's 75 pages or something like that. Uh, so you can spend the uh, weekend uh, reading it. It's, it's... Actually, uh, there's actually a summary, finally. That's like, uh, I'll just drop it here. That's more, more manageable. So if you have like an hour or two, then you should totally have a look. 
yeah exactly but it's like it it's very interesting concept and it's like definitely like thoughts through it's just like very very complex and it's probably also what we might need increase complexity somewhere to decrease it somewhere else uh so i think that's kind of behind uh what rune is thinking and there was a good podcast i recommend and i will drop a link in the telegram chat where hasu and rune were discussing kind of their uh two proposals uh and it was really good discussion about like what's kind of behind uh the, the thinking what they think about each other proposal and so on so thank you denise for coming in uh if you uh can please there is one more question actually if you can like provide some resources maybe about like governance tooling how to build tooling in like decentralized world like DAO, you know uh somehow maybe you manage your team and so on so if you can drop those links or something in the telegram chat it will be well appreciated it this uh video will be on youtube so i will also drop link uh there so you can uh see it or share uh with anyone and anything uh you would like to kind of add as a closing note oh that's always a difficult question I, I would say that um if if you're active in this space like if you're working on this kind of stuff if you're thinking about it it's very important to connect with other people from other projects i know i know you're busy i know it's um it's something that is high friction right but i, I would definitely recommend it because it really keeps you in tune with the rest of the space it prevents you from making stupid mistakes that, that others have made and it also it just makes it a lot more fun if you have some friends all over the world that are passionate about the same thing and every every now and then and when you're at a conference or something like that you meet each other and then um, yeah, you can you can talk about what you've been doing and you can learn from one another because that's the way we're going to uh, progress this space. You're not going to do it yourself. Thank you, Rosines. Great. So next Monday, 2 p.m., uh, let's meet here, uh, you know, and share other knowledge about government. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Thanks. See you all. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye. Bye-bye. See you. Ciao, ciao.